Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Commonwealth Club fireside chat on the coronavirus crisis with Janet Napolitano, president of the University of California and former U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security under President Obama. I'm Gloria Duffy, president and CEO of the Commonwealth Club, the moderator for today, and I'm coming to you from my home in Santa Clara, California. The Commonwealth Club has suspended its in-person programming through at least May 3rd. Today's discussion is the club's 35th live-streamed program since March 11th. You can learn about upcoming online programs at the club's website, commonwealthclub.org. We're updating the site regularly with the many new programs in which you can participate digitally. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club series addressing the impacts of COVID-19 on our community and society, as well as some other topics. The series is sponsored by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of other funders and donors. As a nonprofit supported by donations, we are so grateful for their support and for the support of those of you watching this program. We hope others will follow your example to support the club during these difficult times. To contribute to the club, you can text the word donate to the number you'll see on the screen. To our audience viewing on YouTube, we want you involved, as always, for Commonwealth Club programs. Please send your questions for Secretary Napolitano to me by posting them in the text chat area. I'm receiving those on my iPad, and I'll integrate as many of them as possible into the program. If you appreciate the club's continued programming, please share and like this program on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe, follow, and otherwise help us to spread the word about the club's informative discussions in this very challenging time. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Janet Napolitano. Ms. Napolitano is the 20th president of the University of California and the first woman to serve in that role. She leads a university system of 10 campuses, five medical centers, three affiliated national laboratories, and a statewide agriculture and natural resources program. She also served as the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security from 2009 to 2013, uh, and as governor of Arizona from 20, uh, 2003 to 2009. Ms. Napolitano graduated from Santa Clara University, about two blocks from my house, where she was the university's first female valedictorian, and she holds a Juris Doctor from the University of Virginia Law School. Today, we'll discuss national and state leadership and policymaking on COVID-19, the impact of the COVID crisis on the UC system, and universities and higher education more broadly, and the implications for national security now and in the aftermath of the current crisis. Welcome, President Napolitano. Thank you. So happy to have you with us. I believe you're also in your home. Is it in Oakland? I'm in Oakland. I'm at my dining room table. <laughs> so let's start with uh, national policy and policymaking. You were U.S. Secretary for Homeland Security and, in fact, served during the H1N1 virus epidemic in 2009. How do you evaluate our national leadership and policy in the current crisis? Should there, for example, have been or still be appointed a single czar or national coordinator for coronavirus policy? Are there other national actions or policies you would like to see? Well, I think, you know, every pandemic has its own characteristic. With respect to uh, uh, COVID-19, I, I, I think it's fair to say that the current administration has been slow to the ball and somewhat chaotic. Uh, uh, it looks from uh, the timelines I, I've seen that uh, six weeks were allowed to elapse between the time we, we knew the pandemic was, was coming uh, to uh, when uh, the president uh, began to acknowledge that indeed there was going to be a pandemic and that uh, it could be a serious event. Um, uh, you know, that six weeks could have been very valuable in terms of uh, a, a setting up a national a widespread testing regime, uh, acquiring the materials necessary to do testing, 
uh, acquiring an inventory of masks, personal protective equipment, and ventilators, uh, uh, and making sure that there was coordination among all the agencies in the federal government that have some role to play in uh, a pandemic response. Um, and so uh, it's still somewhat chaotic out there. And now, of course, we have the issue of having shut down the country. How do you reopen the country? And I think we're going to find that reopening it is even more complicated than shutting it down. So what about this question of a single national coordinator? Would that have made a difference? Has it made a difference for other issues that we've faced? You know, there's always the temptation to have a so-called czar. Uh, um, uh, and and in, in, in point of fact, um, uh, I think that the vice president is at least ostensibly uh, performing uh, that role. Uh, during H1N1, uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, myself, uh, was uh, the lead in terms of coordinating all of the federal response. Uh, so it, uh, as I said, every, every pandemic has different characteristics and every administration is organized somewhat differently. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we still need to see greater organization and coordination uh, from the federal level. It is still somewhat chaotic. And, you know, now we are months into this. We, we would hope for greater clarity. So as Secretary of uh, Homeland Security in 2009, uh, you coordinated a national response to H1N1. What did you do? What lessons can we take from that experience for this crisis? Well, we built our response on to H1N1 on the pandemic plan that uh, had been left over from the Bush administration. Uh, um, uh, there are extensive planning documents in Washington, DC. Uh, um, those are updated annually or should be updated annually uh, and are re regularly or should be regularly exercised. Uh, one of the things we were able to do in H1N1 uh, is to identify hotspots in the country where we could focus our resources immediately uh, before it became a widespread uh, pandemic uh, and, and, and necessitating what we have now, which is a widespread shutdown. H1N1 was a different organism than uh, the coronavirus. Uh, uh, lethality was much lower than uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and it was a form of flu. And, you know, we have kind of in the hopper lots of different types of flu vaccines. And so the scientists were able to uh, uh, immediately work on those and uh, tweak them to have a vaccine for the H1N1. So the first case in the United States was in April of 2009. Uh, by July, a vaccine had been uh, uh, approved. It was in mass manufacture in August. By early October, we had a nationwide vaccine campaign underway. Uh, with uh, the coronavirus, it's a much more complicated organism. Uh, developing a vaccine is going to take longer. Uh, um, obviously, we, we need to make sure it's a safe vaccine, and uh, that means it needs to go through the clinical trial process. So the estimates we hear about uh, a year to 18 months, I actually think 18 months is more realistic. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned uh, that there was a pandemic plan. It uh, identified hotspots. It should have been regularly exercised. Do you mean exercises in terms of going through drills about how this would work? Um, yeah, there, there are drills that are called tabletops uh, uh, where um, a scenario is presented and you have the uh, uh, relevant um, individuals from the various agencies um, uh, around. And as you go through the tabletop, different facts are thrown on the table, new developments, because these things are not static. Uh, and you and you work your way through, and then afterwards you analyze what went well, what didn't, um, uh, what could be done better, and then you update the plan accordingly. And so 
do we have a pandemic plan like this now? Have we been doing any such exercises? What do you see for the future of developing and testing a pandemic plan? Well, my understanding is that uh, the pandemic plan that uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, is in charge of uh, has, has not been updated in the current administration. And uh, I, I, I gather it, it hasn't been exercised or, or used as well. So uh, what that meant is uh, that uh, the administration wasn't as prepared as it could have been for uh, a pandemic, even though uh, um, the administration was put on put on notice that uh, a pandemic was one of the uh, kinds of disasters that they needed to continually prepare for. So that sounds like something on the national to do list: uh, update pandemic plan and test it out. Who would do that? How would that happen? How can that? How can we make sure that happens? Looking forward to the future. Well, it, it it is a function of a variety of cabinet agencies, but uh, uh, within uh, the federal family, the Department of Homeland Security has uh, the lead role for overall pandemic planning. Uh, but the leadership has to come from the White House. You know, the the, the White House has to. Uh, say where where are we um, on on pandemic planning? Are we up to date? Are we up to speed? Um, and and when I say the White House, that includes from the National Security Council, um, as well as obviously the president. So let's uh, talk about the state level a little bit. Uh, you were also governor of Arizona. You've had such amazing experience on so many different levels. Um, California and Governor Newsom are being praised for having been tough, for issuing early stay-at-home orders, thereby reducing the spread of the virus and deaths in California. How do you evaluate the state leadership and policy in California? What can other states learn from this? Beyond what California leaders have done, what tools do state leaders have to now help contain and manage this pandemic? Well, uh, in, in point of fact, the governors of uh, the 50 states are really the ones with the authority uh, and the power to order uh, shutdowns uh, for uh, public health reasons, uh, to order businesses to close, schools to close, uh, and the like. Uh, and I think Governor Newsom does deserve credit. He uh, acted uh, promptly and clearly and strongly, uh, followed up on the mayors of the uh, uh, cities in the Bay Area who were a couple of days ahead of them and shut down the Bay Area. Um, and I think the, uh, uh, the analysis is that um, uh, e even by shutting down a few days earlier than uh, cities on the East Coast, uh, that that gave us a greater head start on uh, controlling uh, the, the um, growth of the pandemic and the steepness of the curve. And of course, what you want to do is, is flatten the curve so that your healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed uh, by a surge. And uh, to date, uh, we have not been overwhelmed and it doesn't look likely that we will be overwhelmed. And uh, I credit a lot of that to the governor and, and the mayors for acting so promptly here. So what else can, what can other states learn from California? What else can the states do now? What do you think of this uh, collective decision-making by uh, California, Oregon, and Washington? How are the state leaders going to be able to determine when to reopen things? Right. So Governor Newsom announced... Uh, uh, the guidance that he was using, he has six factors, uh, beginning with the availability of widespread testing, uh, beginning with having an assurance that the healthcare system could uh, handle any surge in patients. And he's got uh, four other factors uh, to look at as well. And um, I think there's some wisdom in coordinating regionally um, uh, between uh, Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, 
there's, you know, these viruses travel um, and people uh, travel even now they, they travel and um, uh, both from a, a epidemic standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint, uh, these three states uh, share a lot in common. Uh, they are our Pacific facing states. Uh, they are um, uh, the states that uh, um, have a greatest concentration of the high tech uh, industry. Uh, they have a lot of trade um, with Asia, particularly with China. Uh, and so it makes sense for them to coordinate, just as it makes sense for the states in the Northeast to coordinate. So there's a six state consortium uh, on the East Coast that is undertaking uh, the same exercise. But uh, the key fact is, is that it's, it's really the nation's governors that are the point of the spear here. They, they are going to have to help lead this country out of this crisis. So speaking of California, the UC system uh, is a very important and large institution in the state. Ten campuses uh, and many other aspects. How has the COVID-19 crisis impacted campus operations? How are you managing the evolving situation on campuses? So great credit to the faculty at the university. They turned on a dime and converted uh, their classes to remote learning or online instruction. Uh, and that has gone uh, relatively smoothly at, at, at all the campuses. Um, uh, we decanted the dorms and uh, the dining facilities uh, 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 as completely as we could. We have some students who have nowhere else to go, and so uh, they were allowed to stay on campus. But by and large, the campuses emptied out. Uh, um, adjustments were made to uh, the grading system so that students could uh, 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 take more classes, uh, pass fail, so they didn't have the, that pressure of the letter grade. Uh, and we began, uh, and we also um, uh, added some flexibility to our admission system so that uh, we would um, count classes that were taken pass fail by community college or high school students uh, this semester. Uh, we suspended the requirement of the SAT for 2020 and 2021. Uh, we wanted to uh, make sure that students and their families in California knew that the University of California was, was still accessible uh, and that the doors were open to them. So that's on the uh, kind of campus side, but we also operate uh, these large academic teaching hospitals uh, throughout, uh, throughout the state. Um, and so uh, uh, we uh, immediately stopped all uh, elective surgeries, and, and sometimes what's called an elective surgery is an important surgery, but uh, we wanted to uh, uh, make sure we had the bed capacity for COVID-19 patients. Uh, um, we uh, um, added 40% um, uh, uh, to our bed capacity. Uh, um, the governor had asked us to increase our bed capacity by 40%, and we did. Uh, that meant, for example, uh, converting uh, some of our operating rooms into uh, rooms with beds, uh, making those kinds of adjustments. Um, we immediately began the process of making sure we had an adequate inventory of masks and personal protective equipment uh, and ventilators uh, um, uh, for um, our staff, for the healthcare uh, workforce. Um, and that was, that's been a bit of the Wild West out there. Uh, the supply chain for that, that kind of equipment uh, was not um, uh, established. And that's, again, something that the federal government should have uh, really taken the lead on. But it didn't. Um, and so uh, um, we, we had to make sure that we had an adequate supply chain, uh, which we did, um, although uh, we still... Uh, run into shortages of things like cotton swabs that you use for the for the test. Um, uh, and so we've had the great cotton swab hunt. Um, 
uh, but uh, all of that work has uh, been undertaken. And, you know, fortunately, uh, uh, I think because of the social distancing that occurred, um, uh, the type of surge that was predicted early in this uh, pandemic uh, didn't occur. And now some of our hospitals are being able to uh, uh, add back in some of those important surgeries that had to be postponed because of COVID-19. There are a lot of questions coming in from the audience, particularly about uh, UC. And I understand that some of the answers are unknowable right now. Uh, folks want to know when will in-person in classes resume? Uh, also, what's the impact on uh, enrollment, financial aid requests, and refund requests at UC? So um, uh, uh, we don't know on enrollment, um, uh, and we really won't know until the fall. Um, although we're doing some scenario planning uh, uh, for possible uh, reductions in um, uh, uh, both students who uh, were admitted this spring, but uh, decided for whatever reason not to attend the UC in the fall and also for returning students. Uh, we're particularly concerned about international students um, and uh, whether they uh, uh, attend or return to the, to the university. So uh, we just don't know on enrollment. In terms of when we can return to in-person classes, uh, um, we're working through that now. Uh, uh, that depends on when we can begin to populate the campuses safely. Uh, and uh, that in, uh, depends on testing uh, and contact tracing and, and all of those uh, steps you have to go through because we want safety of our students and faculty and staff uh, to be our guiding concern. In terms of uh, uh, refunds, uh, um, we are now, uh, we, we did refund uh, the housing and dining fees that um, were not used because students uh, left uh, the campuses. Um, we are also now evaluating some other student fees as to whether they should be um, uh, refunded or partially refunded. Uh, we have not uh, um, refunded tuition, and I want to spend a minute on that. Um, and we haven't because um, our agreement with our students is uh, that we provide the educational content, um, uh, but, but it, it, it doesn't say by which medium we do that. And so professors are still teaching students are still uh, uh, making progress towards their degrees, um, and that's what tuition is for. Uh, so we've held tuition flat. Um, we'll, we will be holding it uh, flat for uh, our existing students um, uh, for the coming year, um, but uh, um, we are not intending a refund there. So, there are many questions being uh, considered right now about the future of education on all levels, both elementary and higher education. Given the move to digital uh, classwork and so on, can you talk a little bit about where you see this impacting higher education in the longer term? Will there be a, a, a whole scale change to conducting classes digitally, a diminishing of the on campus presence for students? Tell us what you what you see in the longer term. You know, I think there are going to be a lot of lessons learned uh, uh, from this uh, uh, episode. Um, uh, I I don't see uh, schools like the University of California becoming. Uh, fully online. And um, uh, I think that um, over time, uh, uh, students will be able to return to campuses and campus life uh, will be able to be resumed. And there's a, there is so much value to that overall in-person student experience. Uh, um, uh, the, that personal interaction with uh, your, your fellow students um, uh, the involvement in student activities, 
uh, um, uh, just um, in addition to the educational life, the social life of, of the campus. Um, it's an opportunity for young people to uh, experience living away from home, uh, many for the first time. Uh, and it's a, it's a terrific growth experience, um, as, as well as first class academics. So, um, uh, but I do see uh, a greater um, use of online learning uh, and greater incorporation of it into the curricula of the university. Uh, um, and, and, you know, we have uh, now um, uh, greater te technology tools uh, for classes online uh, and uh, our professors are learning, learning lots about how uh, the pedagogy of teaching online. Uh, so um, I, I think we'll, we definitely will see more of it. But again, I, I believe that uh, the University of California uh, at some point uh, um, will um, uh, uh, have students back on campus. So UC is also a very major research university. And um, I've worked with your VP for Research's office in the past on the uh, lab fee grants program. And so at the very beginning of the crisis, I got an email seeking to learn within the UC system about all the research going on that related to COVID, COVID sort of taking a, um, making a catalog of all the research. What all is going on within UC, in, in the sciences particularly, uh, in research that relates to the COVID crisis? Oh, so much. Um, uh, this is really uh, the secret sauce of the University of California is the research enterprise. Uh, and we have uh, over 300 research projects underway now related to COVID-19 and from everything from uh, the development of a pop-up testing lab uh, at Berkeley that can handle a thousand tests a day uh, to uh, engineers who have, who have uh, figured out how to convert sleep apnea machines into ventilators, uh, into basic research, into the organism itself that uh, will contribute to the development of a vaccine and better therapeutics, and also uh, um, uh, the um, uh, avail availability of uh, different treatments for uh, uh, the coronavirus. So uh, just a lot of really exciting research, and, and we are hosting some of the nation's first clinical trials. Tell us a little bit about the clinical trials. So um, uh, um, we've got at, at least two that I know of uh, for uh, new drugs that are potential therapeutics uh, treatments uh, for um, uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, both of those are um, in the human trial phase, uh, phase one of the trial process. So. Uh, they're making great progress, moving along very rapidly. So jumping back for one second to the situation on campus, there's a lot of talk going on about how we might have a gradual return to in-person activities where people would wear masks, uh, they might be seated or standing six feet apart from each other. Do you see uh, a gradual return like that on the UC campuses and what might that look like with precautions, but beginning to start in-person activities again? So our campuses are begin each beginning to imagine uh, uh, what the fall term will look like and indeed what the entire academic year uh, will look like. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, it's it's possible that uh, we will remain uh, online through the fall uh, because again, uh, one of the big um, uh, barriers to uh, uh, really fully resuming normal activity is, is the availability of widespread testing and contact tracing. Um, uh, um, but uh, I think um, all of our campuses under the leadership of their chancellors is beginning to think about, well, what would it look like if we uh, 
uh, um, partially opened? And would we do some of the things that you just mentioned? Um, uh, for example, housing. Um, uh, we normally have doubles and sometimes triples in our dorms. I think that's unlikely. Uh, uh, so we have to, uh, would have to adjust our, our housing uh, availability and our housing budget. Uh, um, uh, how we would conduct classes uh, if some people are on campus and some are still learning uh, remotely. Uh, you know, if you had a hybrid kind of class, how would that happen? Uh, so there are lots of variations here and we're, we're now beginning to turn our attention to that. What are the financial implications of all of this? If enrollment is going down, if there has to be distancing or spacing and class density, um, what's the impact on the UC system? Oh, it's uh, um, uh, um, that that is a a, a concern. Um, uh, I think it's a concern for us. I think it's a concern for Cal State. Um, I think it's a concern for every institution of higher education in America right now. Uh, um, you know, we are uh, working our way through uh, various budget scenarios, and there's a lot we don't know yet. We don't know what the state budget is going to look like, and we probably won't know that till the uh, late summer, early fall, once the July tax returns are in. We don't know really what enrollment is going to look like. We don't know how much we're going to get for out-of-state tuition. Um, uh, uh, um, we don't know how our auxiliaries, housing and dining, what the impact on, on those will be. Um, uh, but uh, you know, we, we're we're going to be working our way through kind of a you know kind of a scaled set of scenarios from. Uh, only a little bit bad to really bad. Um, and, and we're just going to have to manage our way through that. On the hospital side, uh, we're also experiencing uh, terrific uh, losses um, because of having to postpone surgeries that uh, um, we would normally be post, uh, performing, uh, having to um, uh, have a, a lot of beds that are um, empty that are being held for uh, COVID-19 patients should they be uh, necessary. Uh, and so uh, we, we are um, uh, right now, uh, like every hospital system in America, um, uh, uh, losing a lot of revenue on the hospital side. Now, one of the other unknowns is how much federal money uh, we, will, we will get. So um, the last stimulus bill, the so-called CARES Act, uh, had in it $100 billion for uh, hospitals. Um, I think 30 billion of that has been uh, distributed. We got uh, some of those funds not near enough to close our gap, uh, but uh, uh, nothing to sneeze at. Uh, um, there was funding in there for uh, higher education. Um, uh, some, uh, uh, again, it was about uh, 30 billion total. Half of that is for students, uh, for um, emergency aid for uh, student needs, and half for higher education institutions. And uh, the Secretary of Education has begun distributing those funds. And so, um, uh, the, the third stimulus from where we sit was a, was a good start, but uh, we're already turning our attention to the next stimulus bill and what it needs to have in it to help protect these valuable institutions. We need great public universities in this country. We need great academic teaching hospitals in this country. So we need to make sure that they're financially supported enough so that they can navigate this crisis. So um, what should be in the next stimulus package? Um, a lot of things. Uh, uh, additional uh, money um, for the institutions themselves, for colleges and universities, uh, uh, for academic teaching hospitals. Additional money to support research. Uh, uh, federal research dollars uh, have gotten 
harder and harder to get. Um, but what we have seen with COVID-19 is the depth and breadth of the American research um, enterprise, but it needs more resources. Um, and so help for uh, students, help for higher ed institutions, help for academic teaching hospitals. There's the Commonwealth Club is a nonprofit and there's a little bit of uh, controversy going on uh, among the nonprofits arguing that they should be equal candidates for CARES Act funding and so on with businesses because they also are an important sector of the economy. There's an organization called the Independent Sector, which uh, advocates for the nonprofit sector that's working very hard in Washington to see that uh, support for the nonprofit sector is part of the ongoing stimulus packages. Similar to the educational institutions, they employ a lot of people, they are a vital part of our economy. Well, that's um, right. And I want to, I think we had a, uh, on that point, the University of California is the third largest employer in the state. Um, one of the things we did was to announce that none of our career uh, staff would be laid off uh, between March and June 30th, because we wanted to send a message uh, uh, both, you know, for our staff that um, they have enough to worry about. They didn't need to worry about losing their job. Uh, and also, uh, we thought that uh, from a state standpoint, uh, uh, um, not adding uh, UC employees to the unemployment rolls uh, would be a, a powerful message. And so uh, we took that step um, fairly quickly. That's terrific. Let's turn to another part of the UC system, which is the national labs. And for those who are not familiar with this, could you just inform uh, our audience about the three national labs that UC runs and how that is structured, how it works? And then we'll talk about what the labs have to contribute in this particular crisis. So the, the university has uh, three national, the, the national labs are a network of, uh, I think there's, there's either 13 or 19 uh, around the country. Uh, we have three. Um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, um, is on the hill uh, at the Berkeley campus. Uh, uh, and um, that, that is kind of owned and operated by uh, the university. Uh, then we are uh, uh, in uh, so-called limited liability corporations, partnerships, uh, to manage Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratory uh, and Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. Uh, both Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos are so-called national security labs. Uh, uh, their funding comes out of uh, the NNSA, the, um, uh, which is part of the Department of Energy. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley is not a sec national security lab. Its funding comes out of another part of the Department of Energy. All three labs are basically funded through the Department of Energy. And all three labs currently have COVID-19 work underway. Um, uh, Lawrence Livermore, for example, has a huge... Uh, uh, computational computing capacity. They have some of the uh, uh, largest and best computers in the world, and they're working with UCSF uh, on uh, processing a lot of the uh, calculations, what have you, that are going into uh, the development of new therapies and, uh, and uh, a possible vaccine. So, uh, um, and the other laboratories are also uh, doing COVID-19 work as well. So um, uh, the national lab work is uh, again a part of a part of the um, uniqueness of the University of California. No other university has three national labs uh, in its enterprise, uh, and they're a valuable part of our enterprise. So. In terms of, there's always a lot of debate about the adequacy of national funding for science research and development, basic research, applied research. 
how has the flow been uh, both to the university system and the labs of uh, research and funding grants and funding for research related to pandemics, biological threats, uh, handling uh, pandemics and crises? Is, how is the flow? Is it, should it be better? Uh, where should it go in the future? Well, um, uh, you know, federal funding is complicated. Uh, um, uh, and we get it from a variety of federal agencies. Um, uh, our, you know, the Department of Energy um, is a key source because of the national labs. Another key source is the National Institutes of Health. And uh, the University of California receives more NIH money than any other uh, university uh, in the country. Um, uh, there's also something called the National Science Foundation. It's a source of research funds. But there are, are research funds in other pockets of the government. There's money from the Department of Homeland Security. There's money from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and so um, uh, our faculty are uh, uh, well-versed and well-schooled in uh, how to uh, seek grants for those funds. Uh, but um, uh, the, the overall pot of federal research money has not been increasing adequately uh, and commensurately with uh, the need for our country uh, um, to support research and innovation because it's that research and innovation that really uh, 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 makes the United States the world's leading economy. And, and staying ahead of the world in that area um, is really key to our economic future. Uh, so um, uh, for you know, every year that I've been president of the university, we have always sought and supported more federal research dollars. And we certainly will in connection with COVID-19. Tell us how you see the national security aspects of this pandemic crisis. Um, is it a national security issue? How do we relate to other countries, international institutions? Uh, what should we be doing to protect our national security in the era of a pandemic like this? Well, it, it, it is a security issue and, and I can uh, uh, name three different ways right off the top of my head. Uh, one is uh, to the effect active duty military um, are infected by the virus. It uh, affects our overall military preparedness. That's a security issue. Uh, a second uh, security issue is that with the virus, so much activity has gone online uh, and that creates even greater cybersecurity issues. Uh, and then the, the third security issue is the use by um, our adversaries of misinformation about the virus. Uh, um, uh, for example, spreading the myth that the virus was created in the United States and then exported to China. Uh, um, uh, done to undercut um, uh, the, the credibility of the United States. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, one of the reasons pandemic and pandemic planning was put in the Department of Homeland Security, because there is a security aspect to this. Um, uh, you know, m moving uh, forward, um, I think we need to recognize that a pandemic, just by ver just the word, you know, it means it's global, it's pan, it's pan the globe. Uh, and uh, these organisms don't stop at national borders and uh, 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 they require international uh, coordination uh, um, to uh, really for the globe to emerge from a, a pandemic. Uh, one of the areas of uh, coordination and cooperation that is benefited by uh, uh, global uh, outreach is the research side, so that uh, scientists here are working on this aspect and a scientist in China or in France uh, uh, or uh, in 
in Kenya, maybe working on another aspect, the ability to share that information so that the science moves forward. Um, that's another area where global cooperation really makes a difference. So it makes a difference in terms of our uh, ability to emerge from the pandemic um, and also uh, to further the science and health associated with the pandemic. So we have the World Health Organization. What other institutions or organizations do we have through which global cooperation on predicting, preparing for, and defeating pandemics can take place? What are the mechanisms globally? Well, the, the WHO, and of course the WHO is in the news because uh, uh, the president has announced that he wants to freeze the U.S. contributions to it, um, uh, um, which I think is really the wrong move. Uh, um, I think where the WHO is concerned, um, its response to this pandemic, um, after we've dealt with it and, and, and we're through it, um, there should be a lot of kind of going back and uh, looking at how different organizations responded and reacted. We should be looking at our federal government. We should be looking at our states. Uh, we should also be looking at the WHO. Um, but to freeze funding for the WHO we're in the, when we're in the midst of a pandemic uh, doesn't make much sense to me. Um, uh, there are uh, other international um, organizations that have a role here, the G7 and the G20 are two that I can name uh, that the United States is a, is a member of. Uh, um, um, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, the European Commission, uh, um, uh, they also, I think, from a pan-Europe standpoint, uh, should have done uh, some pandemic planning. Uh, so, uh, um, but, but I would say from a global standpoint, the, the WHO uh, is probably the lead in international institution. Back for a moment to your campuses um, at, as the third largest employer in the state of California. Uh, how are your faculty, students, administrators doing um, emotionally, psychologically? At first, I think we all thought this was a sprint, and now it appears that it's a marathon. We're going to be engaged in this for several months at least. So how do you monitor and how do you feel your, your staff and your uh, employees are doing at this point? It is a marathon, and uh, um, we, we need to change uh, people's perspectives uh, uh, about that. And I think it's a marathon until we get a vaccine. And a vaccine is, as I mentioned, 18, 18 months away, if, if not longer. Uh, and so uh, during this period when we don't have a vaccine, uh, we're going to see waves of this uh, virus. And if we uh, come out too soon uh, and too aggressively, um, we can be uh, right back in uh, another potential surge. And again, the issue with surges is we, we cannot have a surge that overwhelms our health system. So, you know, there's that adjudication that, that needs to be made. Um, you know, I think overall um, uh, uh, folks are doing as well as can be um, hoped for. Um, you know, with our students, uh, we have uh, um, uh, developed uh, te uh, telemedicine, um, uh, particularly for mental health um, uh, counseling. Uh, and um, that is available through our student health insurance program and uh, through some other insurers that uh, our students use. Uh, that's been uh, quite effective. And I think um, one of the advances we're going to see out of this episode is greater use of telemedicine generally. Uh, uh, but it's particularly apt uh, for uh, the mental health um, uh, side of things. And, you know, we can see, I mean, I got a report uh, last Friday of uh, what um, our student usage of that uh, facility had been, and uh, it, it is, it's gone up. 
Um, uh, but what I'm reassured by is that the students are actually using it, uh, which, is, which is a good thing. But they're stressed. Uh, um, they're financially stressed. Um, uh, they've lost the environment that they were in. Uh, many of them uh, lost their jobs, uh, uh, as well as you know, losing their dorm room and uh, their network of friends, et, et, et cetera. So uh, yes, it, it, it has been stressful for them. It seems like this COVID crisis is accelerating changes that were already in progress in some ways in a good way. So I actually had my first telemedicine appointment. It happened to be at UCSF about a year and a half ago. And I thought that was very forward thinking. Now it's really entering, you know, the mainstream and there is a lot of uh, travel money and uh, strain to be saved by doing medicine that way when, it, when it's possible. So UCSF was on the forefront and we're all accelerating into that now. Uh, some questions from the audience. Um, how, there, obviously, as we collect health information, as we uh, require people to be tested, as we take people's temperature before they go places, this is somewhat intrusive in terms of personal, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, privacy. And so what do you think about balancing the need for privacy uh, with the needs for uh, addressing, treating, preventing uh, COVID? Um. Yeah, this is an area, you know, where our country differs from uh, some other countries, uh, uh, where um, they are much more um, uh, didactic in terms of, you know, what you must do. You know, you must um, have a card that says you've been tested. You must have your temperature uh, taken. Um, you know, there's going to have to be the, an appropriate balance struck. Um, uh, I think um, uh, we're early enough in this epidemic that we really haven't figured out what that balance ought to be. Uh, and it very well may occur that um, uh, people will be willing to sacrifice a bit more of their privacy now in exchange for being able to uh, um, end um, the degree of social distancing that we have. But, you know, again, I think part of it is going to be uh, um, what, you know, how much an individual is willing to tolerate. Another question from our audience, uh, will UC lead in developing protections for communities of color? Right. So, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we are uh, doing is um, paying special attention to uh, the demographics of uh, our patients who have uh, presented with the disease um, and so that we can uh, drill down and really understand um, better why uh, that uh, is and uh, and then hopefully as the questioner said uh, uh, take the lead um, uh, you know I think what we've seen with the African American community in, in New York and Detroit and Chicago uh, is, you know, the very high incidence of African Americans who um, are uh, in the hospital uh, with with COVID nineteen, uh, and then when you kind of drill down underneath it, you find many of them have underlying health conditions. Uh, that are reflective of the disparities we've had in healthcare in our country for too long a time. Uh, um, I think COVID-19 is just bringing those to even greater attention. And so hopefully we can use this crisis to do something about that. So this has been a deeply disruptive time for many families and communities and very stressful. How have you been staying sane and managing anxiety during this challenging situation with, with such a vast organization to uh, ensure the safety and well-being of? Um, well, you know, I always enjoy a good book. Um, uh, I always enjoy a good Netflix recommendation. Uh, I live right on Lake Merritt, so I can get out and walk around the lake. Um, 
So uh, trying to stay, stay balanced, you know, is part and parcel of going through this marathon. Uh, uh, and I hope everyone is uh, uh, taking uh, time to have some uh, personal space, as it were. What are you reading? I just finished uh, reading um, uh, um, a book called The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel. It's the third volume in a fictional account of the life of Thomas Cromwell. Okay. And are you binge watching on Netflix? And if so, what are you watching? Um, I just watched a series called Unorthodox, which is about a young woman who leaves a very conservative Jewish sect in New York. And uh, my brother just recommended that I watch Better Call Saul. So that's probably next on my list. Well, and I'm quite a bit behind because I'm watching all of Grace and Frankie, uh -huh. uh, having not had that particular pleasure before. Um, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about your future. Now, you had announced that you were planning to retire in August. Uh, obviously, stability is very important for an institution the size of UC at a time like this. Talk a little bit about your plans. Are you rethinking that? Well, um, uh, the Board of Regents has had a search underway uh, this year uh, for my replacement. I think uh, that that process is ongoing. Um, uh, um, and, you know, we'll just have to, to see whether... Um, uh, in connection with this uh, crisis, they want to adjust my uh, leave date um, or not. But no, my current plan is to finish uh, by August 1st and uh, uh, take a sabbatical, interesting year to take a sabbatical when we'll still be uh, in, in the throes of this pandemic. And then I'm going to be on the faculty at Berkeley and teach in the public policy school. So um, what do you think about the likelihood that a successor will want to take on this challenge at this time? <laughs> well, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, um, uh, if there is a transition, we will do everything possible to make it as smooth as possible. I, I've just finished being on the search committee as a trustee at another institution for a new president. And we keep checking in with the recruit to make sure he's still planning to come and he is. So I guess there are, if you recruit a courageous person, uh, that quality will continue into taking on a new challenge at this time. That's true. Um, uh, somebody willing to, to take this on, uh, Got to have some guts, and that will stand them well as president of the UC uh, post-pandemic. So um, what can the state, the federal government, we as citizens, residents of California in the Bay Area, do to help support um, the, those who are on the front lines for health care in the UC system uh, and others within your organization that may need help and support? What kind of assistance would you like and do you need? Well, I think uh, um, one thing is simply to say thank you and uh, uh, take the opportunity to express appreciation. People are working very long hours and uh, it's in a, uh, particularly those on the front lines of the healthcare workforce, uh, it's, it's, it's very stressful. So uh, taking time to say uh, thank you and then uh, um, abide by the social distancing rules so that we uh, uh, keep the incidence of the virus uh, as low as we can and uh, prevent us having a true surge, uh, which would overwhelm our healthcare uh, system in California. Um, you know, we have a very good healthcare system in California, but we have a very large population. And uh, if there were a true surge, uh, we could be in trouble. So everybody can do their part and help the community and, and help uh, the healthcare system. So we are just about at the end of our time here. I first came across your work 
a number of years ago when the Commonwealth Club was looking into the issue of campaign finance reform and when you were playing such a leadership role in the state of Arizona on that issue. I want to thank you, uh, Janet Napolitano, not only for your uh, time here today with the Commonwealth Club and our audience, but for your service on so many levels as governor of Arizona, as secretary of Homeland Security, as president of the UC system, all major challenges that you have stepped up to and left your mark to improve the situation in all cases. So again, thank you for joining us today, Secretary Napolitano. Thank you. We are also thankful to all our viewers online. As I noted earlier, the club continues to provide daily digital programming, including tomorrow at noon, when I will have another fireside chat uh, with Dr. Harvey Feinberg, president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who's just been appointed chair of a neutral panel of experts at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine that will advise the federal government on this crisis. Please visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to learn more. This program has been part of the Commonwealth Club's digital series, addressing the impacts of COVID-19 on our community and society. It is supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of other funders. We're grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during this difficult time. And if you'd like to help, please text the word donate to 415-329-4231. I'm Gloria Duffy, and now this program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>